So a couple weeks ago, I was pretty overwhelmed with the world, as I have been lately. Uh, we were supposed to take 80 people to Israel. We should have gotten back two days ago, and that ship sailed. That trip was canceled. And I was thinking about what we would do for Christmas this year, because we were not only taking 80 people, we were taking a film crew with us again, and we were going to bring the Bible to life. And I was like, man, it's going to be a great Christmas. Let's redeem Christmas. Because the last few Christmases have been <laughs> bad, awful. So now I'm like, well, what do we do? I have to change it all up. I'm thinking, man, the world in which we live is crazy. I can't believe everything happening on college campuses. I can't believe all the just the just a absolute hatred that you see, especially for our Jewish brothers and sisters, and just the world that we live in has gone nuts, and people feel entitled. And then I thought, well, at least 2024, when we flip the calendar next month, it's going to be good. We're going to have unity. It's going to be great. There's going to be no issues. Oh, wait, it's an election year, right? Oh, wonderful. Can't you wait? I can't wait. Oh, it's going to be awful. Does anybody feel the same way? We've been talking about it. It just seems like, uh. So two things happen. The reason I'm preaching this message, and it's kind of straight up on gratitude. Two things happened. I watched a YouTube video. I've seen him over and over again for years. But if you ever get a chance to pull up on YouTube, a guy, I don't know how to pronounce his last name, but I think it's Nick Vujicic. Vujic? Vujicic? The Australian man with no arms and no legs. Who's ever seen him? I just saw him like brand new the other day. I was watching it, and it was, uh, it was like a couple of weeks ago, and he was just talking about how his life is full of gratitude, and the man has no arms and no legs. And just his personality. I wish, I mean, sometimes I wish that was me like all the time. I'm like, that would be awesome. And then I saw a, uh, I was driving down the road. I'll show you in just a minute. Giovanna pointed out a, a bumper sticker that was on, not on the bumper, but on the window, a window sticker of a car. And I thought to myself, I got negative. I'm like, I hate it when people go, I don't ever come to church anymore because I don't want to hear a sermon. I'm sick of hearing a sermon. That's how I think people sound when they say that. <laughs> and I thought, man, the world preaches, uh, preaches at us all the time. And so that's really where the message came about. So I've entitled it The Habit of Thankfulness. Before we jump into the message, we got a lot of people watching. I can't go over everybody because we literally have almost 20 states watching everywhere. I will say, Lily and Cody, we are definitely praying for you. You are watching right now in UT Hospital. We're definitely praying for you. Um, Elva, you turned 60 yesterday. You're watching in Florida. So sorry about your Gators, but they're not going to go to a bowl because Florida State will beat them, and so I'm sure the coach will be fired. But anyway, find something to be grateful for because us up here in Tennessee, Volland, we're all good right now. It's all... Oh, gosh. Um, the Payne family, Jerry, your wife, where are you? Um, I, I shouted y'all out last night because Tracy told me you were here and you were here for baptism class because you're getting baptized um, next week, right? So uh, our daughter's getting baptized next week. Man, I've been miscommunication, misunderstanding, disinformation, right? Um, good to see you guys. Everybody, give it up for everybody watching everywhere this morning. <clears throat> So to come on the screen, let's start with this. Let's go, uh, let's go a little self-motivation for a minute. Ready? Uh, you are not what you do occasionally. You are what you do habitually. Did you know that? Don't you wish we would reap the benefits of what we do occasionally? If you could go to the gym, if I could go to the gym one day a month and look great. Come on, everybody. For me, I love when I go to the dentist, when my wife tells me, Brent, you've got a, a cleaning three days from now. That's when I start flossing. Who's with me? Come on, you do the same thing. You're like, something's going to happen, 72 hours. And I go, and, and I'm thinking, it'll be great. It's like that bloody experience. And they look at me like, you never floss, do you, weirdo? And I'm like, yeah, I've done it for three days. And they're like, it takes longer than that to build it up. When I go to my doctor, he was here last night, and I had a checkup recently because I'm middle-aged, and we do that. And you go and have to give blood and you're like, oh, I should have eaten better the last few days. And Dr. Joe goes, Brent, don't worry about it. Three days of eating right is not going to offset the, the last year and a half of eating wrong. You and I are what we do habitually. Habits matter. Anybody in this room have a bad habit? Shout it out. One, two, three. 
Anybody sitting next to their bad habit? No, I'm just kidding. That's bad. That's a little Ed Sheeran moment. Here's what I'll say. I'm not going to get into this. Hey, guys, you need to make a habit of thankfulness. You're like, Brent, I've heard that. Blah, 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 blah. That's wonderful. But habits sometimes can get in the way because you realize that most of our habits are automatically done. 50% of the habits that we have in our life, we do without even thinking about it. We get up, we follow the same routine. It's the same this, the same that. And on occasion, we need to mix it up. On occasion, we need to change up our habits. We as a society, we call them fresh start dates, like the new year, New Year's resolutions. We get to the end of a year, and we're like, man, this has not worked for me. I need to try again. But a New Year's resolution, how long does it last? What is this statistic? Does anybody know how long New Year's resolutions last? Two weeks. So I get it. One moment of motivation with a sermon is not enough, so that's why I'm going to give you homework at the end of this message. Because a lot of us have bad habits. I have bad habits. Uh, my wife will tell me I chew my nails too much. Anybody chew your nails? Um, anybody? I have habits. Like My wife makes fun of me. I'm going to pick on her today because apparently I have a habit when I <clears throat> blow my nose, I always look. <laughs> anybody do that, Robbie? You, you don't do that? Like, Anybody crack your knuckles? I hang out with a guy, and he's just cracking his knuckles all day. I'm like, just pass the Cracker Jacks, man. I mean, it's... I have weird habits. My wife and I were in Florida last week because we were supposed to be in Israel. I wanted Pastor Matt to preach the message. Pastor Mike did an awesome job in Live in the Lobby. So we went down to visit her dad for a few days because her dad is getting older. He's a little lonely. Uh, he just, we just celebrated her mom's birthday. Her mom is in heaven and so we went down there for a few days to spend some time. And the last night we stayed in a hotel because we had to get up early and go to the airport. And my wife laughs at me because I walk in the hotel room. And I, I, apparently I do this all the time. I check the closet to see if anything's in it. <laughs> and I almost think that habit started in 1982 when I was 12 and I saw the movie Poltergeist. <laughs> Who saw that movie? The clown under the bed and in the closet? I slept with my closet door open until I was married. My wife's like, you are crazy. She also, I don't know if it was pick on Brent Week or what, but she's, I was on the phone the other day, and I, I had, a, had a counseling appointment. Somebody called, and I'm sitting on the phone at home, and I'm at my little office, and she walks by, and she just looks at me and shakes her head. And after I hung up, I'm like, what? She goes, do you realize you doodle while you talk on the phone? You never doodle, but you're on the phone. I, and I thought about that. I do that. If I tell you my number, I write my number down while I'm telling you my number. 86, 75, 309. I write that down. <laughs> Who gets that reference? Who has no idea what I'm talking about? Let's raise 86, 75, 30. Anyway. It's weird, right? We have habits that we automatically get into. Many of us have bad habits, and one of the worst habits that we have is we're not really grateful. We don't really show a lot of gratitude. So I'm going to show you this picture. It'll come on the screen. This picture is uh, my wife and I were driving down the car. Consistency is always the key, but let's go to this. My wife and I were driving in the car a few weeks ago, and she noticed. She said, Brent, look at that car. And I'm like, uh, okay. She goes, look at that window. She goes, don't tell me people don't, the, the culture or somebody, we all don't hear a sermon every day about something. And I thought, wow, that will preach. So I took out my phone while I was at the traffic light. We weren't driving. And I turned it landscape and took a picture. Landscape, why? Because I knew I was going to give you this illustration and it would fit perfectly on the screen because it's landscape. That's our society. Do whatever you need to do to make you happy. So what makes you happy? Throw it out. Any, what makes you happy? Anybody? Food? Food's pretty good. What are you eating after church? You, do you know? Who, who knows what you're eating after this service? Raise your hands. You know it. Who has no idea? This is going to be the point of conversation after church. Where I told you all that a long time ago. Almost, I'm gonna, I should start a new restaurant in town. I'm going to call it Who Cares or whatever because it will be packed. Where do you want to go after church? Who cares? Whatever. I mean. Making money, that make you happy? Raise your hands if you like making money. 
So the rest of you who like poverty, I guess. That's awesome. <laughs> Family, friends? Who's excited about Thanksgiving with the in-laws? <laughs> what makes you happy? So here we go. Ready? I, this is the message. And then we're going to get to Colossians chapter 3, Ephesians chapter 5. The Apostle Paul talking to the church at Colossae, to the church at Ephesus, to the Thessalonican church in 1 Thessalonians. And it's just something that I've kind of started to think about a lot. And I, I, we've all, if you grew up in church, you know what I'm going to say, but I kind of started to put it together as a common thread. And I'm like, wow, it's amazing what God's Word, how it speaks to our everyday life, but yet it takes modern-day science for, to get people to th really start to think about gratitude and thankfulness because science has scientifically proven, I've read multiple articles on this recently, that the major factor to happiness in life is not money. It's gratitude. Science has scientifically proven so if science tells us, it's got to be true. <laughs> what the Bible has spoken about all along. Many of us, I just want you to think about this for a minute. We are very unhappy people. I thought it was just us in this community, but I went to Florida, and they're worse. <laughs> so it's everywhere. We're unhappy. We're stressed out. We're riddled with anxiety, we have depression, we fight blood pressure, our immune systems are low, and do you realize that science has proven that gratitude defeats depression, boosts our optimism and immune systems, lowers our blood pressure, the whole list of emotional, mental, physical health responses and reactions to gratitude is immense. And yet it's a choice that we make. It's something that we don't wake up and go, well, I have it or I don't. It's a choice that we have to make. Gratitude. If you want to be happy, why don't you use this week as a fresh start date? It's already built in our culture. It's Thanksgiving. We walk into the Christmas season, the hope of the world, the light of Christ penetrates our darkness. Don't wait for the new year to try to something new because it won't last long. Why don't you start now? This is a moment for me that matters because in my life, I honestly do this, and I've done it for a long time, I utilize the Thanksgiving Christmas season to springboard my faith. I don't want to wait till the new year. I want to start now and mix it up change it up. So I've been doing some things, and I want to kind of lock in with you just for a few minutes, something that you might know, but boy, we all need. I like this old preacher. His name is J.K. Chesterton. He lived in the late 1700s. He died in the middle 1800s. He was a Christian apologist, great author. Here's this quote. It'll come on the screen. When it comes to life, the critical thing is whether you take things for granted or you take them with gratitude. Gratitude is something we don't feel toward ourselves. Gratitude is something that we feel toward others. It's something that someone says to us, does for us, something that we do not deserve. So it starts with our vertical relationship with God, that Jesus Christ would die on a cross, and we'll close with communion in a minute, just to remember what he has done for us, a gift that we don't deserve. And then it filters in all of our other relationships. And when you and I become a man or woman of gratitude, it changes so many things, and we have to fight for it. It's a day-to-day-to-day -to -day -to -day fight. Gratitude is like medicine. Medicine, sometimes we take medicine and it has to build up in our systems in order to be effective. Gratitude is the exact same way. It is not what you do occasionally that matters. It is what you and I do habitually that matters. So i got to stop with all kinds of gratitude and talk about something that happened two weeks ago. You guys wrote me these cards. I'm not sure who spearheaded that. I'm sure it was Becky or somebody on staff to celebrate me pastoring you guys, the greatest congregation on the planet for 20 years. 
And so I got a bunch of these cards. In my office, there's a stack that tall. I get it that most people don't get these, this, these moments. I don't take it lightly. I don't take it for granted. I read every card. I cried like a baby. And here's what I'll tell you. You wrote things on these cards that, that I don't deserve to have said about me. Some of them were funny to break the ice. I'll give you a few. That's how we roll here at our church. I'm not sure what a few of them mean. Maybe you can help me. Like the first one, roses are red, violets are blue. We love you more than a B-52. I'm not sure if that has to do with a bomber or the group, the B-52s, Love Shack. I'm assuming it's that, but it made me laugh. This person is the church person of the year. Pastor, you're a very funny person, and I love your six-pack. You have the best six-pack ever. Thank you. I'm assuming we're talking about a six-pack of Diet Mountain Dew, but thank you for that. Somebody was cutting here. I love cats, and I love dogs, and I love you, Pastor Brent. That was a cut on me. I don't know what this means either. I like Pastor Brent because he knows how to pull off all those corny outfits. I didn't know if that's me. I love his shiny head. That is wonderful. Thank you for that. Thank you for always telling the best jokes. Christmas is coming. And I use this one, but I got to bring this out because it was actually written. Even though you did cut me off at the gas pump the other day, you're still an okay guy. I thought that was, that was the best. I thought that was the best. You know what it made me do? After I read all of those, it made me pick up my phone and text some family, some friends, some of you are recipients of that, just to let you know how much I love you, to kind of push it and pay it forward, to think about gratitude in my life. And J.K. Chesterton is absolutely right. We're either going to take things for granted or we're going to take it with gratitude. And if you find yourself unhappy, if you find yourself spiritually in a weakened state, Maybe it's time to look at your gratitude, look at thankfulness, look at our sense of appreciation, and it's not what we do occasionally that matters, it's what we do habitually that makes the difference. So this will come on the screen. How thankful we are reveals the health of our souls. I preached it a few weeks ago. It's felt like I, it's been a while since I preached because, let's see, um, three, two, three weeks ago, my friend Pastor Dan spoke and Pastor Phil spoke on Wednesday. And then two weeks ago, I got a chance to interview. That was a great week to interview uh, Chris and Shannon Kaiser and her Appalachian Trail Walk and how awesome was that. And then last week, again, Pastor Matt Matt Sandler, whatever he's on, I want some of. But he is a gift to our church. I really felt like that message resonated. It resonated with me um, from a distance. My friend Mitch is in the room, and he did text me and said, Brent, man, I was scared to death the whole time that that boy's going to fall off that ladder. And Mitch said, well, at least he's young if he fell off. I'm like, Mitch, Matt is not that young. That would hurt bad. <laughs> But the prodigal son in that illustration, in that moment, and lives were changed, and we saw people saved in our church. And, and Javon and I watched with her family from a distance and how Pastor Mike and Cecily just love people from a long distance with live in the lobby and building a community that we have and just the, the, our next generation singing and just what a week it was. So it's, been, it's felt like a while since I preached, but I want to go back to four weeks ago, and I talked about the state of our soul for, and just whatever, everything that's happening and really monitor the state of your soul. All I'm going to say to you is this today. And you're going to think, all right, Brent, I get it. You're a preacher. It's church. It's Sunday before Thanksgiving. But honestly, this is not something we should do occasionally. This is something we should do habitually. Are you a person with gratitude? Do you really understand how important that is? So the Apostle Paul, he talks about a lot of things in these New Testament letters. The Apostle Paul is the man. Besides Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, no person has influenced Christianity like the Apostle Paul. 
And so I want to go to Ephesians chapter 5. I want to go to Colossians chapter 3. And I want you to just to think about a few things that I kind of have been putting these things together thinking, wow, there is a common thread here that I don't want to ever miss. So when the Apostle Paul talks about what being filled with the Spirit looks like, A lot of people today, that's mystical. What what is being filled with the Holy Spirit? Is that some great spiritual gift? Is that some mystical experience? It's amazing that he points first to being thankful. When you and I are filled with the Holy Spirit, our compass and our guide, and Christ said, I will leave the earth and I will go intercede on your behalf next to my Father. I will send the Holy Spirit to live within you. It's amazing what, what happens when we surrender and submit our lives to the Holy Spirit, that thankfulness begins to pour out. So here's what he says in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 18 to 20. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, there's such a web here. This this, this all kind of locks together when the Apostle Paul talks about our lives being governed by peace and the word of Christ. Seems like we all search for peace and we have God's word. He doesn't point to the absence of conflict or some theological sophistication. He simply points to thankfulness. So Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 17 is something that I've been kind of locking in on in my life. And this is one of those bleeding moments where I just want to kind of let you in on what I've been thinking about a lot personally. And I really do think all of us need it. Here's what it says. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves. That indicates right a choice. It's a decision that I make every day. I have to make it. At 53, when I get up and I think life is overwhelming and I'm not sure I love this chapter in my life and my kids are all grown, thank God for my little granddaughter, Libby Lee, who's incredible. Think about all my problems. I'm still dealing with plantar fasciitis. My, my boy Keith's in the room, been helping me out in therapy. And I'm like, it's not one thing, it's another I got a haircut, and I told my wife, I said, I probably need to wear glasses today to kind of break up the monotony. (laughs) Shut up, Robbie. (laughs) Clothe myself. That is something that I have to do with what? With compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience. Anybody have that naturally? You're naturally kind and humble and patient. Come on, Josh Heupel deserves another chance, everybody. Anyway. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Since we're members of one body, we were called to peace. And then it just happens to throw this out. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether a word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to, the, to God the Father through him. When Paul talks about what wit, living in the will of God looks like, people want to know, I want, I want to know what God's will for me is. He's going to point to thankfulness. I mean, that is so, like, direct. It doesn't get any simpler than this. 1 Thessalonians 5.18, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Jesus Christ for you. When Paul talks about, now it gets interesting, what freedom from sexual sin or other kinds of defiling sin looks like, he doesn't point to the absence of temptation. You realize he points to thankfulness. Do you know what one, and I read this recently, and I thought about this, and I think I knew this, but I'm like, wow, I never kind of put it in that direct terms. What is one emotion that is more powerful than lust? Thankfulness. Does anybody have a lust problem? Do not raise your hand. (laughs) 
Anybody have a coveting problem? Raise your hand high. Really? Do you realize today st- statistics show this, and this is sad, and this is kind of why we have a coveting problem. You and I grab our smartphones, we engage our phones. Here, here's the new stat, 150 to 200 times a day. You don't think when you pick up the social media app on your phone and you see what other people are doing and where they're going and what they're eating and who they're with and what car they drive and what house they live in, we don't go, wow, I would be happy if I had her, if I had that, if I was there, if I could just eat there. But look what I have and look who I live with and look. uh, You don't think we do that every day? Every day. Go down and talk to the teenagers. We all struggle with coveting, and lust is just a form of coveting. It's like, you know what? What I have is not enough. I wish I had that. It's hard to lust and be thankful at the same time. To be thankful for what I have, to be thankful for my wife, to be thankful for my place in life, to be thankful for where I'm at. Hey, preachers, some of you have been in ministry, you get it. You realize a lot of people, we've had more pastors in this building over the years than I can count. And a lot of pastors come up to me with like, man, if I had a church like Pathways, I would love to be a pastor. I'm like, you don't know those people. It's amazing. If I had that, then I could really be that. That's how we feel. That's our lives. But being thankful and having gratitude is what I have is enough and more. I mean, gratitude is a, is a word like, I know what that means, but we don't really think about it. We, we have manners and we say thank you, but we don't even really think about I think of the servers in our room because years ago I served, I waited tables when we planted the church and I did an awful job. I I found out that is not my call in life. But how hard that job is and how easy it is for one of us to find one little problem and we don't want to even tip them, much less give them a compliment and how hard they work. It's easy to go, well, thank you for this and thank you for that. But this season, just stop and be grateful beyond a manner issue Really think about, put yourself in other people's shoes and go, wow, thank you for what you do for me. Hey, parents with school teachers, Ephesians chapter 3, verses uh, 5, verses 3 and 4 says, Sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which is out of place. But instead, what do we replace it with? Let there be thanksgiving. Cultivating thankfulness. Somebody said this, and I really have tried to take it to heart in my life. And I'm not, being thankful is tough. We have a natural tendency to be negative, especially in the world that we live in. But somebody said this, cultivating thankfulness should be the core strategy in helping all of us fight sin in our lives. Psalm 92, one of my favorite psalms about thankfulness. It is good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your loving kindness in the morning and your faithfulness at night. So how do we practice gratitude? A couple of things that I've been working on, and I just really felt like it's, it's something that we all need to work on together. I don't want it just to be a sermon because it won't go very far. One moment of motivation does not help us with gratitude. Gratitude has got to be built up. Gratitude has got to be a choice daily. So I want you to do something for me. Three things. Three things in the next two weeks. I'm not going to tell you to do it for six months. You won't do it. But for two weeks, between now and December 1st, not even two weeks, I want you to do one thing here. We're going to start with this. I want you to start a gratitude journal. On your phone or on paper, whatever, for the next how many days between now and December 1st, the rest of November, for the ne- every day for the next less than two weeks, I want you to write three things down that you are thankful for every day. Sometime in the morning. And then at night, I want you to go back and Read what you wrote, and I want you to think about that. What are you thankful for? Who are you thankful for? Three things you're thankful for. You're like, Brent, that's going to be tough, man. I don't know. Start with your relationship with God and what he's done for you and your salvation. 
God's grace and mercy, a gift you and I don't deserve, start there and then work your way to others. Start a gratitude journal. I journal, but I've noticed lately my kids, they'll, they'll see my journal one day and they're like, man, dad was depressed. Dad had a, dad was, especially this time, God help me with my hangnail, help me with my hemorrhoids. God help me with my foot, help me with everything. I mean, it's, it's hurting bad. I got to change up my habits because my bad habit is this. I'm kind of writing God all the laundry list of things that I'm struggling with when I should stop and just be thankful for the many blessings that I have in my life. It starts my relationship with God and my family and you. And I just think sometimes our default is negative. Three things that you're thankful for. Secondly, thank somebody. I, I said every week, I was going to give you one this week and next week, but maybe every, like four people in the next two weeks. I want you to thank someone for what they've done in your life. Some of you spouses, it needs to start with you guys because too many of you take each other for granted. It's easy to do, right, couples? Put your head on your pillow tonight and go, honey, you know what? I'm really thankful for you. And kick on the fireplace with the love music <laughs> and see where it goes. From, I, mean, I mean, it could be good. Some people will be like, I, I, we take each other for granted. We do. Find somebody to be thankful for and, and see how that affects your happiness, your spiritual health, even your spiritual protection. And the last thing is pray. Pray Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Think about this verse of Scripture, and, and your prayer should, in the next two weeks, dwell on this passage of Scripture. You can go to all the other thankful verses. That's cool. Take it where you want to. But this is one passage of Scripture I think we should all dwell on as we walk into this season. For it is by grace that we've been saved through faith. It's not of ourselves. It is a gift of God. It's not by works, so none of us can boast. It's nothing that we've done. It's all that Christ has done for us. We owe God a huge thank you. And so I want us to walk into this season with communion. We've got communion planned throughout the holidays. Ending the last, we're going to take communion. I can't wait for Saturday night, December 30th and Sunday morning, December 31st. That's a Sunday. Be in church the last day of a year before we walk into the presidential election, y'all. Come on. We need it. It's going to be a good holiday season. I can't wait. We're going to redeem Christmas this year. Get ready to invite. Be grateful and thankful to what God has done for us and what we can do for others. We are going to do one thing before we take communion. I will say this. Starting on December the 24th, we as a church will embark on 24 days of prayer from December 24th through that third week of January, and we will culminate as a church in this building online. You can participate as well with 24 hours of prayer as we walk into 2024. We're going to be praying, and we're going to really wrap it around gratitude. God, be with us, protect us, guide us, but we are grateful. So if you'll get that communion element out here at home, I know Pastor Mike has prepared you for whatever that you can use to participate with us. Take that wafer, hold it in your hands. Peel that bottom layer off and hold that juice in your hands. And let's just stop and be grateful with all kinds of gratitude for what Christ has done for us, even though we don't deserve it. Take the bread and break it. Eat it. Remember the body of Jesus Christ given for us all. Take the juice and drink it. Remember the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed on Calvary's tree that we might have our sins paid for. That's how much God loves us. Start there. Be grateful. You're not what you do occasionally. You and I are what we do habitually. The habit of gratitude. God, be with us as we walk out the doors today and walk into another Thanksgiving week, another holiday week. Can't believe another year has come and gone. It's time for us to spend time together as family, to reflect, but mostly to be thankful. I love these moments. I really cherish them. It's a fresh start date for me. We kind of turn away to the, the old music. We turn on the holiday music. Things change. We decorate our houses with trees. It seems like things come to life. And I just don't want to be that person where this time of year is all stress and no joy. 
just want to be grateful. And I know I have to clothe myself with it. I have to choose it every single day. May we choose you. We choose gratitude. We're grateful. We're grateful. In Jesus' name we pray.